Here's a book you ought to read, Madeline Murray O'Hare's Freedom Under Siege. Basically, it says that organized religion is working to destroy your freedoms. It strives to influence your representatives, elected representatives, and to write the laws under which you live, to regulate your children's schools, and dictate what is taught there, to censor your entertainment, choose what you and your neighbors will be able to see and read, to determine for all women the right to control their lives and their bodies, and it's your money that makes this possible, this tyranny. The churches of their billions invested in profit-making enterprises, and their wealth grows daily from gifts, grants, government largesse, rent, interest, capital gains, and they're now financial giants. This is shocking, but we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about it with Dr. O'Hare and her son Garth tonight on Alternative Views News Magazine. Madeleine Murray O'Hare is one of the most courageous fighters for civil rights and sanity in the United States. And we're very lucky to have her with us tonight, along with her son, Garth, and, of course, our old friend over there, Doug Kellner. <laughs> now, we ha are going to do two programs. The first one, of course, you'll be seeing now. We'll be talking mainly about church-state relationships, civil rights, and the mass media and also the struggles of Dr. O'Hare over the years. And then on the next program, we'll be talking more freely about religion, its place in society, why people are religious, and looking very closely, critically, at religion, particularly the Christian religion. But let's talk about civil rights and church-state relationships. Your book, uh, Freedom Under Siege, is really a dynamic thing. I really enjoyed it. Of course, it's scary as a lot of things are scary about uh, living today. But uh, we have a lot of myths about the Founding Fathers being so profoundly religious and all. Uh, is this really true? This is the thing that particularly annoys me because no matter where we go, we find the ministry invoking the name of God in respect to the Founding Fathers. And they neglect to point out that the God uh, which the people know and whom those ministers represent is not the same, quote, God, end quote, as those Founding Fathers were talking about. The Founding Fathers deliberately eschewed Christianity. They attacked it vigorously whenever and wherever they could. Uh, the very first book ever written in the United States which attacked Christianity itself was written by Colonel Ethan Allen. They would close up their stores if they knew that, wouldn't they? <laughs> With the American Heritage Furniture in there in <laughs> uh, but it was, and this was uh, a very, very specific uh, assault against the uh, Christian faith. And it was followed by uh, Tom Paine's uh, assault against it, uh, and uh, George Washington, uh, Adams, Madison, Jefferson, all of them. Franklin. Franklin, yeah. particularly. They were all deists. And I think that it is uh, deliberately a deceit of the current ministers to try to convince people that Christianity is the same as deism. What is the, the difference? What is a deist as opposed to an Orthodox Christian? Well, I think since you're on the program and you are a philosopher, <laughs> uh, we might immediately have a difference of opinion because what I constantly do is not go to the philosophers, but rather what I do is go to what the common people felt at any given period and how that was reflected, say, in the newspapers rather than in the uh, books on philosophy. And of course, what was reflected was reflected in our Declaration of Independence. And the Founding Fathers put it there. They put in that by deism they meant nature and nature's God. 
and they thought that there was some sort of creative force that had put the world, uh, set the world into motion or set nature into motion and then stepped back and that was it. Uh, it never again interfered into the affairs of mankind. And as a matter of fact, the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, spoke to this, nature and nature's God or the great God of the universe. And then of course, later on, uh, when we started the, they started the Constitution, they didn't say in the opinion of God or with the help of Jesus Christ. Instead, they said, we the pe people. And in the Declaration of Independence, they said because of the need uh, to reach out to the public opinion of all mankind. This is what they were appealing to, all mankind's opinion, not God's opinion. They more or less were kissing him off and uh, <laughs> just forgetting that there was either Jesus Christ or Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah or Elohim or the I am that I am, and saying, well, there was something. George Washington, you know, absolutely refused to go to church. When he got to church, because he was a politician and he had to go, he refused to say prayers. He refused to say communion. They just had a hell of a time with old George. What? Just over and over and over again. And one of the things, of course, that they have done is to fake George Washington kneeling at Val Valley Forge <laughs> praying to the Christian God. He never prayed to the Christian God. They wouldn't mention the name Jesus Christ if they could avoid it. Abraham Lincoln is a single president of the United States who never uttered the phrase Jesus Christ. So they try to put the words Jesus Christ in his mouth in all of his official writings, and they can't do it. They also put president's heads on piece of paper with, in God we trust. Yes, over they them. do. <laughs> That's a clever propaganda. It is. Oh, very why were these early fathers of the country, I hate to use that term, but that, why were they so strongly against church interfering in state relationships? Well, I think for the reason for that, you have to go back and look at the period of time in our nation's history prior to our forming of our unique governmental system, and it was a unique governmental system at that time, which is that you had a number of colonial groups coming from England and other colonies, all under the auspices of freedom of worship, of not being able to attend their particular church, uh, et cetera, in the country that they were in. But the whole thing that I think that a lot of people fail to understand in the general public is that these persons came to the United States and reestablished the very same tyranny from which they fled in their own individual colonies. The Protestants came into Massachusetts, fortified it as a Protestant colony, and the Roman Catholics therein were driven out. And they had to seek refuge in Maryland, for example, which was the Roman Catholic colony. So what, in fact, we had was a situation of having 13 individualized theocracies, little warring theocracies warring across the border between one another. And our founding fathers knew that we couldn't unite to the extent that we had to unite to defeat the greatest military and naval power in the world at that time, which was England, uh, the greatest economic power at that time, in order to form a new nation with those differences in theology tearing us apart internally. And that we have to, therefore, found a government, part of which was separation of state and church, to separate the church away so that we could band together politically uh, in order to gain our independence from England, which was our objective uh, uh, at that time. Dr. O'Hare. Let, let me interject yeah. something there before sure. you go to the next question, because it's important. We constantly stumble upon some research when we're looking for something else. I know that recently I was trying to find the genealogical lines of uh, Francis Wright, who was a great uh, female atheist. And while I was doing this, I stumbled on to some information about the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Plymouth Bay Colony and the corporations which were assembled to bring people to America. And I found out that one of the basic premises behind that was that English businessmen were infuriated that the Spaniards were colonizing in South America, that they were colonizing in the um, Gulf of Mexico area, that they had uh, been very successful in colonizing Africa. So they decided to uh, experiment with what they called the Protestant experiment. I looked at that and my teeth fell out. Can you imagine that our country was deliberately started with Protestants because some businessmen were, uh, had, uh, were furious about the Roman Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. And in reprisal, they were going to actually plant colonies that were Protestant in America. Okay, then I tried to find more about this in America. It, this, the trail stops dead. So I've gone to my English compatriots and said, hey, we have to find out about this. 
and they are coming back to me full of wisps of it and saying, my God, it's true. It was a Protestant experiment, a deliberate Protestant experiment. So I have to go to England now to try to see if I can't uncover this. But who would know that unless they accidentally happened upon it? So seriously is our history. They pleaded with the information we need when it comes to religion. Let me a ask you this. In your book, you indicate that the government, particularly the Congress, for many years after the Constitution was signed, were very solicitous to make sure that there was this separation of church and state. But after a period of time, this broke down and we have the situation in which we have now. Uh, what caused this, and where are we today in this relationship? There have been a number of causes, I think, at a number of uh, levels of time in the United States, but I think the, the situation in which we are now, uh, which was most compelling, is that in immediately following uh, the Second World War, uh, the United States made a political decision, um, theo, what we call theo-political decision, Mm -hmm. uh, to this effect. They saw that after the First World War, Russia had gone communist. After the Second World War, it appeared that uh, China would go communist. Hell, that's two-thirds of the world. That's two-thirds mm -hmm. of the world lost right there. And the American government became panic-stricken. They had become panic-stricken first in 1906 when they moved in in order to support Christianity at the time of the Russian Revolution. But by 1946, uh, after the First World War, and then after the Second World War, there were a, a number of laws deliberately passed. There was uh, an, um, a concept uh, elaborated that we must be the good guys in the white hats, the Christian, uh, communi uh, the Christian capitalists, and we must be fighting the bad guys in the black hats, the atheistic communists, so that instead of meeting the communistic economic social system head on, and trying to compete with it in the intellectual marketplace on its own level. We didn't. As a nation, we decided to fight communism with God. And this is so idiotic, but if you go back and you read Alan Dulles, uh, and you read uh, the um, uh, policy makers of that uh, era, it comes out loud and clear that we were going to premise our foreign affairs and all of our foreign activities, including our um, uh, communications and our treaties with the European countries, we were going to foster Christianity. Now we find out that this was very, very seriously felt because we find out now that the CIA moved in and erected in every country in the world a Christian Democratic Party, that the leaders were picked by our country, the money was sent in by our country, the politics were dictated by our country as a Christian base fight, emotional fight against communism. So what happens? The communists are winning on the economic and the socio-economic um, ideas. And the, all of Europe, all of Africa, all of Asia is turning to communism, while we are still trying to push God in order to fight them. And we emphasize over and over. Now then, if we're going to use Christianity as a foreign affairs weapon, the nation has to be Christian. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. So in 1940, probably 1942, 43, the government decided that everybody was going to be Christian in the United States. You didn't have a chance. You didn't have a chance. You're young enough. You didn't have a chance. The government of the United States decided that you would be Christian and you would never have an opportunity to choose for anything else. So Christianity was made a fabric of our politics. Uh, you weren't there when Eisenhower was president. You should get down on your knees and thank God. <laughs> because Eisenhower had so thoroughly commingled the idea of capitalism and communism uh, that nobody could get out of this. Uh, uh, I mean, capitalist, capitalism, the Christian and Christianity, capital. right. Yes, against communism. Did this equation of uh, communism with atheism sort of fuel the Cold War hatred of uh, communism and actually demonize communists into yes. absolute evil, the uh, enemy. This is sort of a religious sort of view. Not sort of, it, it was. Is, right. Godless religious communism. Right. All that you have to do is go back and read that whole McCarthy thing, and all you have to do is go back and read uh, the preeminence of the Roman Catholic Church in the politics of that time, and what Cardinal Spellman did, and what Cardinal McIntyre did, and you will be horrified. Cardinal Spellman would go to the White House and dictate policies, 
and that policy would be accepted because this was Cardinal Spellman. Remember, he was probably one of the most powerful persons in the world, mm -hmm. and that the papacy said over and over and over again that Cardinal Spellman could bring any more money into the Roman Catholic Church from the United States in any year than all of Europe could bring into the papacy. And when Spellman went to Rome, he was listened to, and when Spellman went to Washington, he was listened to. As a matter of fact, the early uh, part of the Viet Vietnamese War was known throughout the East Coast as Spellman's War. Right, he promoted it actively. I was in New York at the time when he would speak for the war and against communism. This Bishop Fulton Sheen in the oh, 1950s he was had a terrible. program that I remember watching when I was a yeah. kid where he would uh, draw on the blackboard equations between communists, atheists, evil, and then on the other side there was God, Christians, and capitalism, and he would mm -hmm. uh, rant and rave about the demons. Well, you got the three C's, oh. an intertwined three, three C's, you know. Uh, the other thing that uh, worried me is, of course, we had Father McLaughlin uh, who laid the yeah. network for that uh, out in uh, the Middle uh, West, and then from there we moved into McCarthy. And McCarthy, I'm sorry, he was Roman Catholic, and he was being backed by his church. And they tore the fabric of the nation apart over this whole idea of Christianity. You cannot fight a socio-political idea with a religious idea. And our government is now finding that out. Uh, in a sense, it's finding it out. But now you have a throwback to that period with Reagan and his crowd getting in, and they're going to try it again. Yes, Reagan was telling the moral majority group up in Dallas that the answer to every problem of statecraft in the United States can be found in the Bible. <laughs> you remember that? Well, I, I think that's because, too, that Reagan finds himself in the following position. He's been elected essentially on economic issues. Now, true, religion has played some uh, points back and forth, but essentially, I think what we were looking at was an anti-Carter vote on economic policy to put Reagan in the White House. And when you look at that, you say, oh, he can then deliver on the emotional issue in the public school, or busing, or getting the nice little white uh, uh, Christian kids away from the Negroes, or whatever. He can, he can deliver on those things. And I think uh, that um, the Eisenhower administration, the Nixon administration, uh, some of them were playing that same kind of bandwagon of delivering on uh, the emotional issue of we're going to protect you against the dirty atheist peril and um, that uh, religion can be used against them and playing an emotional bandwagon when they really couldn't deliver uh, politically or they weren't really through the political process able to strike any balance of real balance of power with them. It was during that era that I, I came upon the idea in my head that philosophers should be lined up and shot. Uh, <laughs> because we had a uh, professor of philosophy at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And his name was Malcolm Moose, M-O-O-S. And his entire job after Eisenhower got into office was speech writing for Eisenhower. He never <laughs> wrote a speech for Eisenhower that he didn't say communistic atheism or atheistic communism. <laughs> and following that, of course, he won by his adroit manipulation of religion and uh, uh, socioeconomic factors into the people's mind in one big lump of devil versus Christian that he was given the presidency of the University of Minnesota for that noble deed. Uh, and I ha was so distressed about that because as an atheist, but as an American, and as a citizen who uh, really appreciated what... Um, small little bits of democratic uh, procedures we do have in the United States and the potential that we have in our Constitution. It horrified me constantly to have myself identified with communism, about which I knew nothing at that particular time. Later on, of course, I made a, a complete and thorough study, as much as I could, of the Marxian uh, ideas. But this was an untoward and disgusting thing. Uh, for a professor of philosophy to do, or for the President of the United States to stoop so low as to take those kind of emotional issues in order to defeat uh, what they felt was the socioeconomic thrust of the uh, USSR. And also to promote the interests of religion and the uh, church by associating its opposition with atheism. So it cuts both ways. Well, they that's use the, the anti-communism to defame mm -hmm. the atheists and keep them in their place. That's the thing. You see, for a long time, the dog of government was wagging the tail of religion. And now the moral majority thinks it's the dog and the government is the tail. 
and the moral majority is about to see if they can't wag the dog. Can you uh, comment on this? Uh, some people claim that uh, the role of the moral majority and these other Christian right-wing political groups indicate a increased and aggressive role of the church and religion in uh, politics. Is this true, or has this been going on more covertly in the last uh, decades of American political It has life? always been going on covertly, and I think that what we're seeing now is simply uh, the response to their ability to gather a tremendous amount of money and to use that money uh, in order to effectuate their purposes so that they can l yell louder. But the message that they have is just exactly the same as the rest. The one thing I am distressed about more than anything else is that I have seen the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Jews, come out and officially chastise the moral majority when the moral majority is only doing overtly what they are doing covertly. But if they come out and say, look at that dirty nasty over there, then nobody will see them sitting over here being dirty nasty undercover. And it's, uh, this is, again is another trick. But all that this is, is it isn't a groundswell. It's an evidence of more money, which cigarette has the most money to advertise. And media visibility. That's right. And using the most advanced techniques of advertising in the media to promote uh, these ideas. And to focus this at the right place at the right time so that they can effectuate what they want. But you know, one of the things that I don't understand is that we see on, uh, and I really don't understand this, and maybe you have an answer, and I'll ask you the question here. Uh, on ABC, NBC, CBS, every place, uh, you will have a show that has a run, and it'll last one year, or two years, or three years, and then it's kaput. But these people get on, and they are extremely dull, <laughs> and their run doesn't stop. They just keep on going, and they keep on piling up more and more money for mediocrity. Now, I had an occasion to, to talk, incidentally, about why we elected Nixon with one of uh, uh, my friends in England, Baron Avro Manhattan. He's a theopolitician. <laughs> And uh, he said, oh, I know why the people elected Nixon, which may be the reason that they watch this kind of television. He said, because your people are mediocre. <laughs> they identify with mediocrity, and that's what they want. And I would hope that this isn't true in America, that the American people are not identifying with the mediocrity that comes on that tube. I think that the, particularly the Christian Broadcasting Network and the so-called PTL Club and these sort of Christian programs that are year after year on are playing on people's real needs and their real fears. People are afraid of unemployment, of an increasingly insecure world. They're suffering all sorts of frustrations, and they want some sort of security, consolation, etc. And these religious broadcasting uh, corporations are very skilled at manipulating people and to getting them to cough up money to uh, solve their anxieties and fears. That is, they offer these solutions that, well, if you want to be saved, if you want to make it through the tough times ahead, you pray, and we'll pray for you. You send $15, <laughs> and your problems will be solved. Well, that's true. They talk about it. You, know, you hear a lot of times, if you want a job, just pray, and Jesus will find you a job. And Jesus send us $15, find you and we'll pray for you, which yeah. is really uh, preying on the needs and the fears of the people that are a disadvantaged um, lot in American society that haven't had the education and the leisure and wealth to educate themselves. Well, yes, I think that true. that's true, but I think that probably it is much more, what they do is much, has, is much more pernicious because in their doing this and appealing to those individual components of our population, they also are undermining basic principles upon which the nation is predicated. And once those basic principles are lost through uh, the great press of the populace pressing for them, they are down the drain, and that's it. Uh, and I'm talking about the very basic, um, um, oh, rights which were put beyond constitutions or laws or, or anything else, uh, the, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, for instance. Uh, I was just reading the history of those yesterday, and it says this is something which can never be changed. It is taken out of the power of government to change it. It was adopted at the time of the... Uh, Constitution and this Bill of Rights is just a listing of those inalienable rights of man and that no government can do it, so that this is not a part of the contractual part of the Constitution. They would do away with this. Mm -hmm. uh, they would shut people up because, oh, you're talking about pornography. You cannot speak. 
oh, you're printing pornography. You cannot do it. And yet I sat there and listened to uh, a daughter of one of the most prominent men talking at great length of how, how far she would go with petting with her husband-to-be, but he could not insert the penis, etc. I sat there fascinated because she thought she was being pure, and all she was doing was being a tease, and all she was doing was really uh, causing extraordinary frustration for herself and the man involved, and uh, uh, came the time for the lights and the fireworks, it wasn't going to come, and I knew it, and she knew it, and everybody else knew it, and you thought, oh, this poor woman, she's going to be deranged in another year. <laughs> Well, can, we, can, we, can we get back to some history? I, I really want to talk with you about the famous Murray case back in 1963, which you attempted to kind of restore the balance in some small way, at least, in church-state relationships and getting prayer uh, and religion out of the public schools. Can you give us the background on that and what the, uh, what the results were, not only legally then, but also what happened to you, how you were treated by people in the, in the courts and the government? <laughs> <laughs> we have to laugh uh, because that's such a long story. I think probably the most compelling thing that uh, people who watch this program need to know is that uh, we went to the public schools and said uh, we were not interested in having the King James Version of the Bible read in the public schools or a recitation of the prayer uh, to Jesus Christ. There was at that time a great deal of controversy in Baltimore, Maryland, because the evangelicals uh, who believed that Jesus Christ said to pray in private didn't want prayers in schools. Mm. The Jews didn't want a prayer to Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholics wanted the Douay version, and the atheists <laughs> went in and said, why bother with any of it? <laughs> so when we went in and asked for this, uh, we spent uh, a little over eight months arguing with the school board and finally the official school board requirement which came down to be laid upon my son was as follows in order not to offend his christian uh, 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 cohorts in the classroom he must stand and assume a uh, an attitude of reverence while the bible was made, was read i've never been able to figure out what an attitude <laughs> of reverence is Second, when the prayer was said, he must move his lips as if he were saying the prayer, because <laughs> otherwise it would be offensive to the Christians if he didn't, because then they would see that he was not participating in this thing that they held so dear. And likewise, Jews or Hindus <laughs> or people of other religions had to do similar? Yes. Well, if, I didn't, uh, if he didn't do this, fine. We fought the only thing that we wanted. The only thing we asked for was we want to get out of... Uh, the classroom then let him be excused and they said well if he is excused from the classroom he must stand outside the door in the hall which is a place for punishment <laughs> uh, that so that everybody will know that this is a place for punishment and then we just of course went in uh, that fight took three and a half years and no one takes time to read it now or to understand it what was barred from the public schools was religious ceremony and a prayer is a ceremony no matter how you slice it, it is the core, the root, the thing that makes religion. Without prayer, there's no religion, because prayer is communication with your God, and there's no need of having a God if you cannot communicate with him. So the absolute essence of religion is the ability to reach your God uh, with some sort of message, uh, for instance, as to your purity, your devotion, uh, whatever it is, your adherence to his ideas. And the Supreme Court recognized that this was a religious ceremony, no matter if it was openly said, quietly said, with student permission, without student permission, uh, with school participation, without. Uh, it was still a, a religious ceremony, and this was what was ruled out of the public schools of America. When uh, you finally won your case, what was the response of different parts of the country, as well as the media, in covering your role in this? Was there compliance immediately with it, or was there resistance? No, there are several things, which is also, I, I, I think it must be, there are several things must be point out, pointed out. The religious community are so hypocritical as a class, the whole community, all of them, all together, are hypocritical because they fought me tooth and nail. They were the ones who called me everything they could in articles where they were interviewed. I was uh, the blackest of the black and the lowest of the low. On the day that the United States Supreme Court decision was rendered, 
immediately the head of the Presbyterian Church, the head of the Roman Catholic, oh, they all rushed in and they said, well, we knew all along that this was an unconstitutional exercise, and we feel that this is an excellent decision. Mm. And the Presbyterians, the Jews, remember the Baptists, the Methodists, their official bodies, the National Council of Churches, all of them came out and said, oh, how wonderful. We must keep in compliance because uh, this then absolutely guarantees, one, separation, and two, pluralism. Which is what the country was founded mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. That's right. But at, at no time mm -hmm. would they mention the dirty name of an atheist uh, in all of that, and it always all of their comments spoke to the United States Supreme Court. It never mentioned the fact that the case was brought by atheists or atheists were involved or what have you. You want to argue with him about his last statement, I know. He said what <laughs> the country was founded on was pluralism. <laughs> the myth. Well, the separation <laughs> between church and state, freedom of religion and speech, and this. I mean, that's at least what we're told. Yes. Well, you've undergone, some, you and your family have undergone some terrible persecution at the hands of uh, the state and also individuals and organized religion. That I don't think people now realize the severity or remember the severity of what you've gone through. Uh, I wrote one book on that, which only brought, only covered a particular period. Uh, for instance, the, the day that the decision was handed down was the day when we were under the most attack. Uh, I mean defensive attack. Uh, I mean, we, we had to put up a defense. Even our dog's jaws were ripped apart by some mm -hmm. policemen who uh, attacked the house that night. Police, no less. Yes. Uh, they put a, a club well, in his dog's mouth and twisted it and tore his mouth up. Ironically, it's, it's because of the persecution after the decision that we were forced into a position of our family becoming essentially professional atheists because nobody in our family could hold a job anywhere in the United States or do anything else but becoming uh, official and um, uh, absolutely full-time mentors for separation of state and church and going after it all the time. We couldn't do anything else. So actually, the Christian community owes uh, the thorn in the spine that we are to the fact that uh, they wouldn't let us do anything else. Or we might have just been able to retire into the various occupations and fade into the background. But they I was extraordinarily naive because I thought, ah, as soon as the United States Supreme Court speaks to this, everything is going to be cool and people are going to pat me on the back and say, well done. You uh, sustained a uh, principle upon which our nation was founded and you lucky girl will hire you back now at double the salary <laughs> because I had a position before that. And instead of that, there was such a burst of fury and hatred. Uh, my father was killed uh, through that. Uh, he mm. died uh, during an attack upon our house. Mm. He had a heart attack. Mm. Uh, Who was attacking? Who was actually attacking you? Christians, uh, actually mostly Roman Catholics because they would identify this. Uh, they came to the house one night with a noose to hang me and uh, I went out uh, to face them off on our porch about 30 pieces of people and they would say, yes, we're Roman Catholic. This is the 1960s that in an enlightened uh, hmm, decade, democracy. Yeah. Well, you were actually driven out of the country, literally, though, weren't you? We were driven out of the country hmm. on two different occasions, um, and we have been stripped of all of our possessions. We lost everything down hmm. to the clothing on our back. How did uh, they do Five that? different occasions. Um, and the, 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 the legal fights against us and the suppression and the abuse, the physical... For instance, my oldest son, uh, William Murray, uh, was beaten up uh, during one year of this 126 times, 126 beatings mm. uh, during that period of time. Uh, we couldn't go to the store. Many stores wouldn't permit us to purchase food. Mm. Many stores wouldn't permit us to purchase clothing. Bla banks! said, you know, we have the right to refuse customers and we simply don't want to do business with you. Uh, we had to go out of the state of Maryland to have a bank account. Uh, it was the most incredible thing. My son, uh, I gave him some uh, uh, mail to take to the closest post office box uh, in order to drop it in because we wanted to hit the 5 o'clock pickup since this was something for the United States Supreme Court. And he trots off out of the house. He's 16 years old to drop this into. Uh, the mailbox and then turn around and come back. He isn't gone. He hasn't come back in four hours. I'm frantic. I had the police searching for him. All the time that the police is searching for him, he is in the police station, beaten mm -hmm. by the police, and had been picked up for loitering uh, on the streets of Baltimore City. 
and when he came back, he was mutilated. His body was a mass of bruises when I finally found that they did have him in a cell there uh, in the police block. So we couldn't move. Um, I, can, I can't tell you how many times we made frantic runs for our cars in parking lots or where we mm. were abused and maligned. Talk about Austin, Texas a moment. How many <laughs> times I have been insulted in a restaurant. Mm. Uh, the doctor tells me to walk two miles a day. I can't. I cannot go out and walk two miles any place in Austin without being accosted by a religious nut. <laughs> so it continues today. This has been going on you for know, decades. I, I <laughs> thought one time I would get away from it, and I was down at Barton Springs, and mm -hmm. only my head was <laughs> just my chin in the water. And somebody swam over to me and said, you're Madeline Murray here, and I want to talk to you about the second coming. I thought, oh, uh -huh. no, it can't be. Uh, it's not as intense now as it was before, but uh, uh, Christians are, are nasty. Thinking. Why um, are they so intensely hostile towards atheists? What are the psychological <laughs> roots of this wildly irrational behavior on the part of well, these people who have harassed you? We have a couple theories. Yeah, I, <laughs> one, of, one of the theories that I have is that an atheist, I feel, is essentially doing something uh, on a personal plane that a lot of religionists wish that they could do. That is, they are living their life in terms of their own uh, intellectual capabilities, and they're solving their own problems and tackling things as they're going along, and they're not living with a crutch. And a religious person uh, has uh, that crutch to depend on for a certain part of their existence. And when they see somebody who is quite adequately functioning without that uh, emotional uh, kind of a crutch, they can't stand it. Uh, it's almost like the kid in grade school that everybody hated terribly when they made an A and broke the curve and everybody else's grade points dropped down uh, because they, uh, uh, they broke the teacher's curve. And uh, I think it's that same kind of uh, reaction to us a lot of time because there are a lot of people that are Sunday go-to-meeting religionists that really philosophically are not aligned with what they're hearing. And they're or they don't it, um, uh, fully and deeply believe in the doctrines. You raise doubts about that, about it. threaten All right, now this crutch. is the thing that I want to speak yeah. to because uh, you, when you believed in God or if you did, or I don't know what your position is now, but you and you and everybody watching this program, you, everybody, somewhere along the line doesn't believe in God. Uh, something happens and they think, oh, if there was a God, he wouldn't have permitted this. And they have these <laughs> terrible, terrible doubts. Maybe but, there isn't one. Yeah, mm -hmm. but everybody around them believes in God, so they think, well, I can't be right, and everybody wrong, so they bring themselves back into the system. Then here they see a personification, 180 pounds on the hoof, of their <laughs> own <laughs> doubt walking right there. And they can't let their doubt walk around. They have to go up and say, hey, you are my doubt, and I am going to kill my doubt because I must be in conformity with what everybody else thinks. Because if I do not, then I must accept their faith system because their faith system obviously is correct. It's dominant. So when they see an atheist, they must do something with that atheist. And the more their own faith system is um, uh, shattered by that original experience when they didn't believe, and the less capable they are of getting back into the media uh, of uh, religion, uh, that much more are they adamant to kill the atheist, get him down somehow, because this is their own fear and they cannot face it. How, how do people rationalize the contradiction that Christianity preaches love, love thy neighbor as thyself, and yet they're engaged in incredible hatred? Yeah, but you see, that's not true. Christianity doesn't teach love. Christianity that's one teaches, of the doctrines. No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. it, one of their, doc their basic doctrine is intolerance and hatred. Their basic doctrine, Jesus Christ said over and over and over thematically mm. in the New Testament, you must hate your brother, hate your sister. I came not to bring peace but the sword. I came to turn brother against brother, father against son. I, he says finally in his final outburst, yea, even unless ye hate yourself, you cannot come unto me. Ooh, that's sick. Mm. Ooh, that is sick. It is a doctrine of total and complete intolerance and total hatred. It's a doctrine of acceptance of death. Because all Christianity is, from the beginning to the end, 
is your preparation to meet death. And without that, the whole, what Abraham Lincoln called the Christian scheme of salvation, uh, that uh, death was introduced into the world by uh, the original sin of Adam and Eve, and in order to overcome that death, you must accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So you spend your whole life preparing to die. This is insane. It's anti-life. It's anti-love. It's anti uh, just everything that is human and decent, and it's based on that. But then they attach the big lie to it, and they say, ah, but this is love. For God so loved the world that he gave it cancer? <laughs> or for God so loved the world that he killed his own son? Mm. Ooh, I wouldn't kill my own son. Well, these are paradoxes at the base of Christianity. Don't you think that it's sort of a <laughs> illogical religion that is based on all these contradictions and paradoxes? Because obviously they do have doctrines manifesting love, but also ones manifesting hate, as you just pointed out. But a tremendous amount mm. of that love, I have just been over uh, some Jewish scholars preparing for uh, some programs that we are doing in respect to the uh, Old Testament. And over and over and over again uh, in this, uh, uh, the Old Testament, it is when they say love thy neighbor, they mean love that member of the clan. I see. They do not mean the goyim. And mm. over and over and over again they say it. They do not mean the other Semite groups who were worshiping the other Jewish Semitic gods at that particular time. They don't mean that. They mean only that particular cult uh, which wants to continue to worship uh, the, um, well, whichever name we want to put to the Old Testament God, as four. <laughs> right. uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> at the time of the handing down of the Ten Commandments, there were 3,000 persons in disagreement uh, with Moses as to whether or not they should be accepted, and the Levites were called upon uh, to immediately slaughter those 3,000. And so we can't, we can do without you. You're the wrong kind of Semite. Oh, there's a lot so, of that in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of that in the Bible, and these Jewish scholars go into a great deal of uh, uh, biblical uh, scholarship, uh, internal evidence to show that the word na neighbor only means a fellow follower of Yahweh or Jehovah or Elohim or whatever we're going to call him. It doesn't, that love does not extend to anybody outside of that tribe. And I think that most of the rabbis, if they were honest on public uh, um, media, would say that. But of course, they're not going to be honest on, on public media. They're going to be honest with their fellow Jews in a synagogue. Speaking of public media, uh, what's been your experience with the media? You've been on all kinds of nationwide programs, talk shows, all the famous people. You've tried to get airtime yourself. What have been some of your experiences in the media? Uh, I don't think that anybody really understands that we don't have a free media. Um, uh, Mike Wallace, for instance, had me talk for six hours uh, with uh, a four of men to see what I could say or what I couldn't say. Uh, Johnny Carson, uh, I was closeted with his attorney as to whether or not I could say the word atheist, whether I, I <laughs> just, it is incredible hmm. the amount of censorship that is on those talk shows. The other thing is that talk shows are formatted in such a way that you cannot say to the person who is questioning, oh, I don't want to answer that, I want to talk about the real issue. You would never get back on the show again. So what you have to do is confine yourself within the limitations of this. And I have been told over and over and over again, don't you open your mouth about this. Don't you dare say that. Uh, for some of the biggest name talk shows in the world, uh, I think probably the most discouraging thing that has ever happened to me is to have uh, Phil Donahue jump up and down like a little small boy in a tantrum and yell and say, it's my program, it's my program, and you'll say what I want you to say. And did they get on the air, the tantrum? Or oh, no, of course no. not. They deleted no, it. No, this is it It's not live. <laughs> There's an illusion yeah. that these shows are live. This yeah. is in the green room in back yeah. when yeah. you are told what you can't. Garth was there that yeah. day, mm -hmm. and he just sat there and watched Phil Donahue. I couldn't Donahue. believe it. The other thing, too, that we see all the time is that there's this new uh, syndrome of audience participation shows mm -hmm. where the basis on which they're broadcast is that everybody in the audience is right, no matter what their opinion is, mm -hmm. and that uh, no matter who the guest is, the guest shall be brought down to the lowest common denominator intelligence-wise of whoever's in the audience. So even if they get a physicist on there, he's allowed to sit there while some housewife gets up and tells him how 
uh, a, a nuclear power plant works uh, and that he doesn't know anything about it. And that's one of the things that's very, very hard for us to get around and we get bogged down in, is that we'll get on a show with that constant referring and that's a, I think a Phil Donahue type format because it was pioneered by him is that we get on those shows and we have people in the audience who will want to get up and argue about, you know, how many hairs uh, on God's head or how many camels can pass <laughs> through the eye of the needle, and we'll spend uh, half the show on that, or half the show arguing about um, kosher symbols on foods or, or something like that, and we never get anywhere uh, to make our point. It's an important this point. This is the yeah. thing that discourages me greatly, because what we have in the United States is civil equality, not intellectual equality. And when somebody says to me, prayers are answered, and my opinion is just as good as your opinion, their opinion is not as good as my opinion, because I have done a hell of a lot more research than they have done. Uh, and the same thing with you. Uh, somebody is not going to come up to you with a third grade opinion and say, I'll tell you what Nietzsche said. There's no <laughs> way you're going to permit that, because you have some expertise in it, and you have invested some time and energy. Yet we have, we, we constantly get on uh, programs also where someone is there who's going to talk in tongues. <laughs> and uh, this infuriates me because I spent 20 years in universities, or we have somebody else who has spent 15, 10 uh, years in a university attempting vigorously to pursue something like electrical engineering. And then you've got somebody who is intellectually lazy who never got past the eighth grade, who never read a book in their life, and they say, I know how to become famous. I'll babble. So they mm -hmm. get on and they babble, and all the cameras come in and they say, ah, you babble. And these people are instant uh, heroes or instant celebrities or instant everything else. Out of what? Out of mediocrity, out of a uh, gimmick, out of... Uh, they probably don't even babble, right, if one would go into the <laughs> history of glossolalia and find out what true babbling is all about. If we only had some tapes from old babblings, we could uh, compare them. When, when you've been on these talk shows like uh, Donahue and Johnny Carson, and he said things that are interesting and substantive vis-a-vis -vis the religious and political issues that you're concerned with, have you found that sometimes they're censored out? The fact that they can edit uh, afterwards these programs have uh, things that you liked and that you thought should be said been taken out? Do you have that experience? We have that in an unending way. I'll tell you the thing that is most frightening is when they take the first part of one sentence and then 10 minutes later they pick up the last part of another sentence and they put it together and then they cut away right at the clip so that I am speaking and then they cut over to the other person and then when they come back if my body posture has right. changed no one notices it. Right. And I have sat there and heard myself say the most remarkable thing <laughs> <laughs> that I, I constantly say let's sue. Well, I can't sue. I That's cannot right. sue because I'm a public figure. And anybody can say anything they care to say about me at any level, and I'm, quote, fair game. Garth has now gotten uh, into this. He is speaking. Uh, he's been on just about every national show, too, and uh, has traveled extensively and done shows on uh, uh, city levels in New York, Chicago, etc. And once again, the same thing happens. There is serious censorship, very serious censorship. Well, didn't you used to have scripts that were censored before you well, were allowed to do the oh program? Yeah. yeah, that's a very good example. We started something that was the first in America, which was an American atheist radio series. And we started it off on what is now uh, KLBJ, which was KDBC yeah. radio here in Austin. And at the time that it was KDBC, of course, it was owned by the Lyndon Baines Johnson family. And we started at the time that um, President Johnson was in the White House. And we were required to submit a script, uh, I think it was two weeks a written script, prior, yeah. a written script, two weeks prior to the radio program. And that was reviewed by the local attorneys, the station managers, sent to Washington to be reviewed by the president's personal counsel. And then once it was okay, it was sent back to Austin and well, we could go on the air. Well, it was also sent to the FCC in between. And did they read yeah, pencil yeah. a lot of uh, material in it? Did they, they, they oh, yes. rewrite your script? Well, actually, one, after one gets censored a couple of times, one censors oneself right. because you know what you can slip by and what you can't slip by. So if now, you incidentally, uh, Louis Shanks, uh, the furniture dealer, uh, immediately purchased the next uh, half hour after my program or the next 15 minutes 15 after minutes. my program so that he could get a minister on to refute anything that I said. I have never yet 
heard that any of those ministers had to write their tech staff, send it to the local law firm, send it to Washington, send it to the FCC, to have it come back, have it approved, have it redlined, and then put on the air. They had no difficulty at all. We had enormous problems with those programs. You know, talking about church and state, et cetera, the FCC requires religious programming on radio and television. Public service. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure, yeah. and, uh, and yet, they don't require them to come under the Fairness Doctrine. <laughs> Let me tell you the funniest Isn't thing of right? all, because I think that this is so incredible. Starting with KDKA Pittsburgh in 1930, when it was first licensed, the first radio station, uh, the Federal Communications Commission laid down a regulation that 5% of all broadcast time must be given free to the churches. And this was a requirement for a long, long time. Uh, later on, of course, I raised so much cane about this, and I filed, I think it was a total of about five different suits and, and uh, five different kind of um, uh, inquiries and appeals and um, asking for changing of regulation with the FCC. I made myself such a pain. They changed it, but uh, what they would do is go to the uh, television and radio stations and say, well, it isn't required, but it's expected that in all fairness you'll give them 5%. So here they are completely dominating the airways. So we went in and we said, well, where's our 5%? <laughs> and they said, well, now you're not a religion. However, just the moment that we get on to a local t uh, television or radio program, uh, I will be called up from Chicago. I was just called from Los Angeles yeah. yesterday. They asked me to come out to Los Angeles, fly out to do the... Uh, what is it called? The the uh, some kind the of hour a new, magazine, uh, news magazine program, which is syndicated on 95 stations, 18 million listeners. And I said, well, what what are we going to have here? They said, well, if you come on, we have to give equal time to religion while you are hmm. on. I said, how many religious people have you had on this show? Oh, scores. Did you call me up for equal time when <laughs> they were on? No. Well, but when I go on, you must have equal time. So I'm called into Chicago. I told Madeline, you will have one hour. We'll fly you up. We'll pay your way. You walk into the studio and sit down. I come in. There's a rabbi, a minister, a guru, and a, <laughs> and a, a um, priest. priest. And they're all sitting there with their black on. That's because their brains are dead and they are not <laughs> <laughs> It's not because they're anarchists? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, please don't uh, belabor the fair name of anarchy. <laughs> Uh, so they're all sitting there, five to one against me. That immediately means if I have 60 minutes, but I don't because there's 10 minutes of advertising, so we're down to 20 minutes, and five people are going to talk in 20 minutes. That gives me four minutes out of an hour. And they always say to me, isn't this fair? We mm. have really mm. programmed this so everybody has a proper portion. And we are getting to the point now that we just refuse to go on. And I have some classic lines. I, we were just asked to come up to Dallas, and I said no. I said, if you had a brain surgeon on, you would not bring in a witch doctor to oppose him. <laughs> but then again, I don't know but what they might with the Phil Donahue format. So it's very difficult. In the few minutes, about four minutes we have All remaining, right. I'd like to ask you something. Uh, considering the tremendous persecution that we've talked about and hatred that's been focused on you and then the struggles over the years, Certainly this must have taken a, a toll personally or on your family life or something. Uh, what, what, I'm what has hopelessly it done? insane. <laughs> uh, we have, I think the whole family has a sense of humor that you wouldn't believe. And if we ever take him seriously, we are done for. If we ever start to get paranoid, we're done for because they're really out there. Uh, so <laughs> we have to take it and laugh it off. We have the most bizarre jokes. For instance, in the Atheist Center, there's a great big jar full of green stuff, and we call it our, our Jim Jones Kool-Aid. And every time that the, the uh, church comes out with some idiocy, why, we invent this in the office, too, and we incorporate it in our routine. And I must say that uh, the American Atheist Center is pretty much like MASH, uh, except that the theme is different. We have the same kind of bizarre situations going all the time, and we ease the tension with the same kind of uh, bizarre, uh, risque, uh, and black humor comedy that they do. And then, of course, almost all of the atheists who are really atheists and who are uh, working very, very hard in this are, are anarchists. Uh, uh, I'm an anarchist, an individualist anarchist, and, and Garth is an anarchist. 
uh, so that um, it follows along with uh, just everything that we are involved in in our personal life. And uh, um, no, it's not bad at all. It's not a bad life. It's their problem. Whoever mm -hmm. does the hating has the problem, not me. What, what keeps you going in, under all this uh, persecution? Is it just <laughs> simply the belief or, that you're right or no, that I mean, you're no, fighting the no, good fight? <laughs> I, I, I've told Mother on a number of occasions what she should do is like the, like the recent Superman movie that just came out, what she should do when they ask her, why are you in town on a particular program? And she should look square under the camera and say, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way and just leave it go at that. Because when you write, it, uh, <laughs> none of it bothers you. You just kind of sail right, right along. And we are very um, secure and content in our position. We uh, uh, feel that we've come uh, down on the right side of the fence. So we well I along. think one of the things also that uh, really annoys us is if somebody says to, to uh, Gorris, for instance, how does it feel to be Madeline Murray all here son? Well, how does it feel to be anything else? <laughs> how does it feel to be a Christian idiot? <laughs> you know, how do they get, how do they manage? How do they get along? Uh, don't they, don't they have terrible, they must have terrible problems of dependency and inadequacy and guilt and anxiety. They must live a horrible, horrible life. Anybody who wants to die and go to heaven has to have a very, very bad life now. So being free is yeah. uh, its own reward. That freedom is so exhilarating, it's incredible. Uh, we are in a kind of a, a state of euphoria all of the time, and we don't even need marijuana to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Let me close with a, a couple of quotes from that uh, wonderful atheist Ambrose Bierce. Oh, he yeah. has uh, one uh, in his Devil's Dictionary, remember? The, on religion, the definition of religion is a daughter of hope and fear explaining to ignorance the nature of the unknowable. <laughs> and we were talking about the importance of prayer a while ago, and his definition of to pray is to ask that the laws of the universe be annulled in behalf of a single <laughs> petitioner confessedly unworthy. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you. And we'll do another program just shortly, and we'll okay. show that to the folks in another week. Okay, For the Christmas present. I would say God, <laughs> Godspeed, <laughs> but I won't. Careful, <laughs> careful. Good night. <laughs> If you're an 